But I think what people are starting to understand is that the conversation doesn't have to be sad and somber. It doesn't have mm. to be, I'm so sad and I'm so depressed. Like mental health is something that needs to be focused on every day because just everyday things affect our stress levels, our anxiety. And as long as we've been living, as long as humans have been around, we found ways to literally not talk about it and to not express it. And if we do, people will still call us weak. People will still think, oh, that person needs help or that person can't handle the pressure. Exactly. When that, when that is the furthest thing from the truth. I'm Adrian Starks, known as Mr. Purpose. I'm a speaker, voice narrator, comic card and superhero fanatic, book lover, martial artist, health enthusiast, and just a fellow human seeking purpose. Join me and our guest as we navigate the chaotic journey of life of what I like to call the human mess to discover how we can craft and share our purpose. There's no single path, but together we'll explore the diverse perspectives to uncover the tools to help you shape your purpose your way. Let's get it and let's create. Welcome back, everyone, to Your Purposeful Life Podcast, and I'm your host, Adrian Starks, and today's topic is going to be about how to manage anxiety and stress, along with depression. I have a guest on today, and his name is Mark Paysant, and he is a certified personal trainer and the creator and host of the Relatively Normal Podcast. Mark, welcome to the show today, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Ooh, the conversation about managing and coping with stress and anxiety and all the things going on. And we're also going to talk a little bit later about an action step that the listeners can have that can help them to manage that. But let's get right into this here about anxiety and depression and mental health. It seems to be a big word going around now, a lot of hashtags about it. Why are we hearing more about this? And, that, and that's great that you've, you've noticed it and that people are noticing it. It's because it's... it's it's still kind of a taboo subject. It still has a stigma surrounded by it. And I, but I think what people are starting to understand is that the conversation doesn't have to be sad and somber. It doesn't have mm. to be, I'm, I'm so sad and I'm so depressed. Like mental health is something that needs to be focused on every day because just everyday things affect our stress levels, our anxiety. And for as long as we've been living, as long as humans have been around, we found ways to literally not talk about it and to not express it. And if we do, and this is the case for today, like people will still call us weak. People will still think, oh, that person needs help or that person can't handle the pressure Exactly. when that, when that is the furthest thing from the truth. I like that you brought that up because the first thing that a lot of people will think is, oh, there's something wrong with them and we mm -hmm. need to change that dialogue. There's nothing wrong with them. It's what's is what they're seeing that that is happening. And actually, they are the ones who are more self-aware as opposed to a lot of us who just ignore it. And this idea of mental health. So mm -hmm. I did some research here and it looks like there's over 450 million people. I'm going to say this again, 450 million people across the world who are suffering from some type of mental illness or mental health concern. What do you think about those numbers, Mark? Do you think that's that's possibly true, accurate? I, I personally think it's it's true. I want I, I always say it like this to people. And as I've gotten older and, you know, as me and my wife have gotten older, my friend, my friend base has gotten old, we've gotten into middle age. You know, we start to wake up with those little aches and pains. And, you know, I got a little shoulder thing going on. And, you know, I have mm. friends who have a little back thing going on. And it's the first thing we say. Like for, uh, yeah, I have a buddy down the street that we literally use the same Cairo and acupuncturist for our shoulder injuries. And we, we talk about that daily, weekly at least. Mm -hmm. And at no point would either one of us think to, you know, limp down the street or, or throw ourselves into a, a situation where we'd injure ourselves more and not have that conversation. It's, it's, it's just so normal. It's so just easy to do. And I want that same conversation to be when it comes to how we're feeling. Like I want that same, like I want us to be able to go and say, I have a big interview today and I'm just stressed out about it. And, and for someone not to just say, Oh, you'll, you'll, you'll do okay. You'll do well. You, you got this, you got this. 
because when, you know, if everyone in the, in the world, half the people in the world worked, walked around with knee injuries or, you know, some type of skin ailment, we would hear about it every day. We, that would be fr- like, we need to do something about this. But when those same people are walking around with some sort of mental health issue, then somehow, some way we're, we're surprised by the numbers or we don't mm-hmm. believe the numbers or we don't think that's a real thing. When the last time I checked for you to be a living, breathing human being, you have a brain and you have feelings. So <laughs> that just makes sense. <laughs> and again, I'm trying to normalize this. I'm trying to make the conversation normal where it's not two people coming on a podcast and wondering, oh, is this real? Like, I want to make, I want to normalize this conversation. Mm. Speaking of normalizing, let's talk about your podcast, Relatively Normal Podcast. Mm-hmm. And what is that actually about? What does it entail and who is it for, Mark? So I, I created that show for, uh, as a platform for men, especially black men, to talk about their feelings, to see me. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like to see a six foot five, 235 pound black man say, I'm sad today. Like I want them to be able to hear that, see that, and feel that and be like, oh, Marcus, Marcus saying that. Maybe, maybe I can say that. And it's kind of branched off into a number of different things where I've had guests on, I've had doctors on, I've had therapists on, I've had educators on, I've had a few people from different uh, minority groups talk about what it's like to to go through mental health issues in their minority group. Because it's, you know, we know as black men and as black people, the conversation we have not had in our past. And the same might go for Native Americans or the gay community or Asian communities. And I... I was having a conversation before this all started with my, my therapist on just a a really bad day I was having. And the funny part about it is that the day itself wasn't bad. Like nobody was injured. Nobody was sick. The sun was out. I had my job, like (laughs) everything was good, but mentally I was in a really dark place. Mm, And I remember being in, yeah, I remember being in his office and about halfway through, he, he just asked me straight up. He's just like, Mark, tell me, what do you want? Tell me what you want. Verbalize that. And I said to him, I just want to be like the people outside. I see without a care in the world, not going through this, this stuff. And I just want to be normal. And he's, he told me, he's like, listen, this is your normal. Normal is relative. Like you may just need different coping mechanisms, like your chemical, you have a chemical imbalance possibly. And, and the way you react to the world and your triggers puts you at a lower place than than a lot of people. And the way you constantly overanalyze and constantly think about what's going wrong. It's like, there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to, you know, work on it a little bit more and, and work on your coping mechanisms. And that, that stuck with me for that, for since that day. And then Brainchild was a relatively normal podcast. Amazing how an experience can take something and spark it for you. Like in that moment, you actually reshaped your purpose. Yes. You said, this is what I'm going to do now. And this is what I'm going to do, how to serve people. Mm -hmm. Speaking of serving people, for people listening today, how can they help? Say for instance, someone says, oh man, I think I have a friend like that. Mm -hmm. I think I have a, a person in my family like that. How can they help someone in need? that is experiencing some of those triggers and symptoms that you talked about, should they just tell them, hey, you need to get some help? (laughs) Or should they go about it a different way? I love this question and I love answering it because as humans, we really complicate things. We really do. Yeah, we do. (laughs) We do. And, you know, (laughs) I'll give you an example of what I've learned from my friends. Because I, you know, as I've gotten older, my friend group has gotten smaller, quality versus quantity. And you're here. Yeah. And so I remember having a conversation when I started my podcast with one of my my dear friends. He actually got me into the the business. He has a a radio show and a podcast. and, And I told him what I was planning on doing. And I said, I would love for you to be a guest at some point because I want to know how you felt the moment I opened up and said, I've suffered from, you know, depression in my life. And from that moment on, he would make time out of his day to just call me, to text me, to say, hey, brother, I'm just thinking about you. I love you. And I hope you're doing Mm -hmm. well. And then his wife started doing it. And then I started the show and I had a few men reach out to me and say, 
you know, thank you for, for saying the things that you're saying. You're saying what I've been thinking for the longest time. So we all have cell phones. We all have these computers in our pockets and we all text every day. And I'm telling you right now, just a simple, hey, no reason to, to text back. I was just thinking about you. I hope you're doing well. I hope you know that I'm here for you. And simple things like that, because what, and I'll specifically say depression, depression is very isolated and it's very selfish. We think the world is on fire and it's our fault and we can't mm. do anything about it. And we feel alone. And once that person says you're not alone, it, it, it opens up so many things. So you don't have yeah. to be a doctor or therapist. You don't have to be someone that like specializes in anxiety or ADHD or, or depression or bipolar or anything like that. All you have to do is use the two things on the side of your, your, your face, and that's your ears. And we don't do a good enough job of listening and really responding to the cues that people give out. Oh, yeah, you're right. We don't, we don't listen to those cues. We're just trying to find a way to fix them mm -hmm. or fix yes. the problem. Yes. And that's the issue right there. It's not about fixing, it's about understanding. And I like how you said to people who go through depression, they feel like it's their fault. And mm -hmm. I think it's really good to put emphasis on that feeling because most people on the outside think they're just depressed because they're just depressed or they just have horrible things going on. It's like, it's their personal responsibility that we're taking on that we really don't have to, but we are. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed. We are also seeing, Mark, a rise in athletes that are going through depression. They're coming out publicly about this, celebrities. So it is a good time now to really get into this idea or perspective about how do we resolve the conversation around that? So your experiences in your life growing up, you were dealing with some weight and confidence concerns, which obviously impacted how you feel about yourself, which hence goes into a little bit of the depression perspective. Why did you decide to reshape your purpose on this feeling? What was the moment that, that you just said, I'm done with this feeling of myself. I want to release the weight. I want to improve my confidence. Was there a particular moment or was there a number of steps that led up to that? There was a moment and I, I, I did what a lot of us do. I, I, after I graduated from college, I, you know, went out too much, drank too much, ate the wrong foods and always was like, Oh, n tomorrow, next week, I'm going to get on it. And I did the whole joining a gym for 30 days and then not going and, and paying for an entire year. And <laughs> the one year, the, the, the they one say year, resolution. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, and I even had a whole show that I did on why new year's resolutions don't work. That just put too much pressure on you because people are like, I'm going to lose weight. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find somebody. I'm going to make some more. It's like, man, you haven't done that the last 25 years, but you're going to do it now. Like calm down a little bit. So, Real talk <laughs> uh, and that's not me being mean. I'm trying to help people. I'm really trying to help people yeah. add a little levity to it. But, um, you know, I, just so people know, I'm a twin. Um, there's actually two of me in this world, and it's um, <laughs> and Michael. Michael got things a lot quicker than I did. Um, he was financially stable. He got married. He had kids. He's in the military. Like he got things before I did, and I always kind of compared myself to him. And it wasn't even really a comparison. It was more like I wish. I could be like, why can't I be more like my brother? Like, that's what my parents want. That's what our friends want. I'm, I'm sure that's what so many people want. And even though I'm the older twin, if you were to meet us when we were younger, you would always think he was the, the older one. He was more mature. I was the happy-go-lucky, just goofing around, having a good time. But I was masking a lot of feelings with my, you know, with my levity and, and my comedy. And um, it only a few select people in my life could see through it. And, you know, my wife, for instance, like one of the first times we met, she was just like, why, why, why are you doing that? And I was like, why I'm doing what? Like, you're, you don't have to do that. And I was like, man, she saw right through me. That's, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> um, and so as I become a, a young adult, again, not doing the right things and, you know, my, my wedding photos, I'm out of shape. I'm overweight. I feel terrible. And it got to a point where I started therapy and I started hearing the words that I was, I was worth it. I was worthy of love and affection and appreciation because I didn't think I was. 
And I'm not lying when I told you it took like years of therapy and years of hearing that for me to start to understand it. Hmm. And one of the things that therapy really helped me with is understanding that comfortable is not the right place to be. Comfortable is not the right place. I was comfortable going to work, coming home, watching TV, eating bad, going to sleep, doing it all over again. The moment that I decided, and listen, I decided one year I was going to do it, but I said, I'm not doing it January 1st. I'm going to pick just a random date in January. And I'm just going to go outside and go for a run and see how it feels. It felt terrible. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. It felt, it felt absolutely horrible, but I did it. I got it done. And I started hearing those words that, you know, you're worth it. You can do it. Like people are supporting you. So I did it again the next day. And then when my, with my friends help, my wife's help, I, I started to look at the food I was eating. And it's like, and then you, you see that one pound go down, then that two, and then five and 10, you're like, wait a second. Like I, I have power. Like I, that is the thing that people don't realize is how much power they have, how much strength they have. And sometimes you have to be told and you have to be shown that, but we do have so much power and I just needed someone to like believe in me and trust in me. And it happened to be a, an absolute stranger. It did as in a therapist, but that's why I'm, I'm an advocate for therapy because sometimes we need someone we've never met in our life to tell us that we're worth it. Tell us that we're worth it. You know, this idea too that you said made me think about the years of therapy that you needed, the number of steps. And I think for people that are listening, it's not a overnight thing. Or if you're going through it right now to stick with it and find, like you were saying earlier, the co what, what works with you when it comes to coping. That is the healthy way, of course, everyone. And to know that you're different, you're going to respond differently to different things. It reminds me of when I went through therapy. And you and I connect on a lot of levels here. I went through a moment where I went through a major divorce. It wasn't major, but for me at the time, I thought it was major. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, and it put me into a really deep state. And I remember someone saying, you need to go to therapy and maybe talk about this. And I said, I'm not going to no therapy to sit on no couch, have someone ask me questions about my childhood and all this stuff. So, no, not me. That was the story I had in my head. Mm -hmm. So I went in with resistance and it didn't work because I had resistance. But that therapist gave me a book. She said, you need to read this. Come back to me when you're ready to open up a little bit more and we can talk. And I stayed away for about a couple of weeks. But then that voice creeped in again. You're not worth it. And then I said, I need to go somewhere where I can hear the voice say you are worth it. And this is what you're talking about with the support. And it really helped me out a lot. And I'm glad it helped you out. Because look at you today, man. You're here on this show and you're really spreading this message across the world. Now, you're also a trainer. Mm -hmm. So I want to reiterate the importance of how you've meshed purposes together. You lost, you, you released the weight. I like to say released. Mm -hmm. You released the weight. You got healthier. Now you're saying, okay, there's something going on here with this duality. Mental, physical. So you're a trainer. How does physical fitness tie in to mental health? So I had, this was a really, this is a big turning point in my life where I had lost over a hundred pounds and I was, I, I liked the way I look, but I remember not liking the way I felt. And, Ooh. um, okay. I, I, I was in my office in, 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 I want to say Glen, somewhere outside of Baltimore, Maryland, when I lived up there. And so let me kind of tell you, I'm, I'm married I, my wife and I bought a house. We have two kids. She, you know, everything is kind of the check boxes are checked. And okay. I remember just thinking, I need to call my, something is not, something's not clicking. Like something, I, I lost the weight. I'm supposed to feel great about myself. Like what I did, what I was supposed to do. Like, why is this not working? So I remember calling him on the phone and I felt good calling him. But by the end of the conversation, I was crying to him. Cause I was like, I don't know what else to do. Like I've done, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've, I've gotten healthy. I, I'm able to play with my girls. I'm married. I have like, I've done everything. And he's like, Hey, why don't you come in and, and let's start talking about this. And I said, okay, I'm uh, uh, let's do it. And he put me on to some game real quick, which I didn't know at the time. 
And there is a fact, and I wish I had the, the numbers in front of me, of the amount of people who lose the weight but still feel depressed because every time they look in the mirror, they see the person that they used to be. And I cannot yeah. tell you how many, how many days I starved myself and just went for longer runs and didn't eat and watched my carb intake just to get smaller and smaller and smaller and just to feel worse and worse and worse. Hmm. And he kind of explained that to me. And if you were to like look through my 30s, you would probably see years of really good physical fitness but at the same time years of poor mental fitness. And then you'll see the next year, the opposite. And you'll probably see a weight gain and weight loss with that. So finally, about little, almost two years ago, I said, there's got to be there's got to be a way I can combine these things. Like, how do I do? I can't just go like yo-yo dieting and yo-yo weight is, is more dangerous than keeping the weight on. It's exactly. horrible for your heart like that. It's terrible for your organs. And, and so I said, wait a second. And this has clicked one day. I said, I have a coach for my mental health. I have a therapist. Why don't I have a coach for my physical health? Huh. And I said, I'm going to get a personal trainer. I'm going to get one because I need someone to push me outside of my limits and just like my therapist, like I wouldn't get anywhere of my therapy sessions if I stayed comfortable. Why am I just going, like running every day was comfortable for me. Going to the gym and maybe doing 30 minutes and talking to people, that's comfortable for me. I need someone who's going to push me past my comfort zone physically. And that first session was, was hell. That first session was terrible because he knew I was a, a former athlete. He said, you should have never told me that. You should have never told me that. <laughs> Nice but he push. started, yeah, he started <laughs> pushing me, he started pushing me. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you have that little voice in the back of your head. That's like, listen, this is my life. I can quit. I can quit if I want to. Like, I don't have to go back to him. Yeah. I paid for the session, but I can get my money back. I was like, why would you do that? And so what I started doing is I would have to mentally prepare myself to go into the training sessions. And then I'd have to decompress afterwards. So I was using coping mechanisms for both physical and mental fitness and then I started seeing a body that I hadn't seen in years. And that light bulb went off. Like if you work hard and if you push yourself past your limits mentally and physically, you can get to where you want to be. And I started using my workouts for stress relief, which why I hadn't done it in the past. I was more stressed leaving the gym because I hadn't lost enough weight. And it's like, wait a second. No. Use it for stress relief. Use it to become a better version of yourself. Use it to show the girls you coach and the girls that you're a father of and the, your friends and your family that what hard work can do for you. Become a, a mentor. Become a leader. Like Become that light that people need. And it all clicked for me. And that's why, I mean, I, I mentally and physically, I haven't been in this good a shape ever. And it feels amazing. That's great to hear. This idea of mental health is actually so important because that is part of your health. Like you mentioned, there's so many that have the physical fitness, but they don't have the mental health to match that. Mm -hmm. They're constantly chasing something. Constantly, I think too that when constantly, constantly, right? Yeah. And we're trying to. I think too when people are really trying to release more weight, release more weight. There's a part psychologically. I think this is how I was. You're trying to erase that person. And hopefully oh, yeah. a new person just can shows I, can up. Can I just say, right? I want to say something to that real quick because, <laughs> oh my, every Facebook photo I could find, whether it was my page or someone else's page of the old me, I deleted them or I untagged myself. Hmm. And people would be like, did you, because you get notifications and people, did you just go in my, <laughs> did you go in my picture from 2011? And yeah. I was like, yeah, that person doesn't exist anymore. And I want to tell people, my therapist was so good at helping me forgive that person. That person is there. That person is there. Without that person, I wouldn't be me. And he's like, don't, don't hate that person. Don't hate him. Forgive him because you've become this out of that. So I had to mention, once you said erase that person like that, something just, yes, you're a thousand percent correct on that. It happens. You know, I was there too. So we're talking about these mechanisms, the coping mechanisms of anxiety and depression. You gave us your story and what's happened and how you came to be. What action step 
can someone take today that can help them cope better or further with their anxiety and depression, Mark? I tell you what, I um, my coping mechanisms in the past have been, the negative ones have been food and uh you know, just taking myself out of just becoming a loner and and not talking to people and time. The the thing I used to do is when I got really down or depressed or anxious, I would always tell myself, okay, you know, this is how many days it's going to take for you to get better. I would do nothing and just wait for myself to get better. And I mean, weeks went by where I was feeling down, just waiting for the day I'd wake up and feel better. That is not at least for me, that was not a healthy way to do it. And we can use the cliche ones like, hey, write down your feelings, you know, do some meditation, you know, journal, talk to somebody, go for a walk, get in the sunlight, um, turn off all electronics and just sit by yourself, do your daily affirmations, which are all great. I'm not going to, I'm not knocking any of those things. Those are when you start, like literally when you feel bad, if the sun's outside, go get the sun on your skin. Cause that automatically feel, makes you feel better. If you yell into a pillow, if you breathe for, you know, 10 deep breaths in a row, that's going to make you feel better. I know those things. But there's one thing I like to offer people before they even start that journey, because these are just quick fixes. These are just really quick fixes. I need people to start treating themselves like a friend. And what I mean by that hmm is any one of my friends could call me and say, Mark, I was in a car crash. Mark, I hurt myself. Mark, I'm not feeling myself. Mark, I need some money. I would automatically be non-judgmental and help them. But I wouldn't do it for myself. And a lot of us won't do that for ourselves. The first thing we'll do when we make a mistake is we'll tell ourselves how stupid we are, how we deserve what we get, how you know, how can we be so like the, the self talk is one of the worst things that we do to, to ourselves. And if we just reframe how we look at ourselves internally and put ourselves as a outside external friend and start reacting and responding to our emotions that way, it can change and it can change quickly. I'm talking about days and weeks, not months or years. Like the first time you tell yourself, oh, I'm so stupid, then you stop for a second and you're like, wait a second. No, I'm not. I just made a mistake. Like, you're okay. You're good. You're fine. And you start to reframe your thinking. Like that goes a long way into helping somebody deal with their, their mental uh, issues. Great answer, my friend. <laughs> That's a good first step for everyone listening today. And this has been an amazing conversation. Mark, what does living a purposeful life mean to you? You know, I, when I first saw the name of your, your show, I, I was so attracted to it because I'm like, this is, this is exactly what I've been trying to do the last 18 months to two years. Like I, I feel like the first 40 some odd years of my life, I was kind of going through the motions and kind of having other people figure out what my story was going to be. And then I said, you know what? No, I'm going to live with intent. My pers per, uh, purposeful life is, is living, doing things with intention and living with intent, making sure when I go to the gym, I understand that I'm doing this for my health. It doesn't have to be physical health. It doesn't have to be to get bigger muscles or get lean, anything like that. I'm making myself a better person. When I go out and coach my girls, I'm not doing it because I need you know time to burn or I have time to burn. I'm doing it because I'm trying to instill in them the right attitudes, behaviors to become, you know, successful human beings in this world. And, you know, when I'm at my, my work, I'm not overanalyzing where I think this is who I am. Like my job provides the money I need to live and provide for my family. My intent is what makes my life purposeful now. And that's, that, that is the biggest, that that's the best answer I have for this because I really thought about that and, and, Intent and purpose really go hand in hand with me. Intent and purpose. I like that. Mark, it's been absolutely amazing to have you on the show today, brother. You've been wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate it. I had a great time. Thank you for listening to Your Purposeful Life. And I'm your host, Adrian Starks. 
download this podcast on your platform of choice. Join me on my social media channels and be a part of the Your Purposeful Life community. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that like button with a purpose. Come on now. Remember, your human mess is the process. Let's help you shape your purpose your way.